Hello, 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 and welcome to number 48 of the Wonder of Stuff vodcast broadcast live on Google Hangouts on air every weekend. This is the place you'll find news, information, and commentary on space, science, engineering, technology, everything from the past week and beyond everything else that interests us from inside our tiny little human brains. As ever, my name is John Gardner, and to help us out on this journey to knowledge, let me introduce my colleagues, full, full house this week, Richard Smith and Ross Davidson. Say hello, chaps. Hello, chaps. Hello. Why is my video not working? Oh dear! Technical <laughs> gremlins straight away. That's a that's a great omen. <laughs> and uh, you better get it oh, on, yeah. Richard. Uh, there we ah, go. Yeah. no, there you go. Right. Okay. Turn I'm, off and on again. Okay. So um, uh, yes, we're here. We're full, full, full collective tonight. Uh, so uh, let's get straight on. We've got a, we've got three topics as ever, and uh, the first one is for Ross, and it's um. It sounds like some sort of German uh, Nazi project. It's Wendelstein 7X. Yes, the Wendelstein 7X device. So basically what this is, is um, it's the world's largest nuclear fusion machine of its kind, um, which they're apparently just about to turn on in Germany. Um, and it's something called a Stellarator. Um, now this is, apparently has cost $1.1 billion to make, and has taken 1.1 billion uh, million man hours to create. Um, a million. Think, yes, it was named. It was named um, in. I think that the project sort of effectively started like 20 years ago, um, and they're just at the point. I think they finished constructing it last year. They're at the point they're going to turn it on. Um, and like I say, it's called a Stellarator, which is basically um, it's it's a very very complicated machine. Now, I'll describe what it is, and you'll be like, oh, okay. Um, it's based on a five-field period Helios configuration, mainly a toroid, tor toroid yeah. consisting of 50, no 50 non-planar and 20 planar superconducting magnetic coils. So it's about three and a half meters high um, and about uh, it's got a diameter of about 52 feet. So what I'm going to do first is just show you a picture of this in construction. So um, let me show you this. So this is basically the constructing it and sort of finishing constructing it. And as you can tell, it does look quite complicated, but that isn't even as complicated as when I show you the video. So this is basically a video of the magnetic field. So basically, we, we've, we've talked about fusion reactors before. And you use magnets to keep a, a field so, I mean, in. So basically, the, the the difference between fusion and fission is well, I guess fission is the splitting of the atoms, isn't it? And fusion yeah. is the fusing. Yeah. Yeah. Funnily, funnily enough. So the, and you've got you've got to sort of um, contain the the reaction in in space using magnets. So if I if I just play this, so that that red thing there is the magnetic field, the purple. Is the magnets that are that are creating this field, and you can see the shape of them is slightly odd. Um, this why, video. Why? Why odd? Why? Just to 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 maintain that that sort of shape. It's been designed by computer, so this hasn't been designed by like scientists. So that, so that is the optimum shape the for this type of shape. reaction. Optimum shape. Yeah. So I've got another video here that shows the actual sort of construction of it. So I'll show you this one. So there's the magnetic field. There's the magnets. There's all the cabling. <laughs> then there's all sorts of things around it. That's an electrician's nightmare. Exactly. Yes. Um, so basically, this is this is it's a it's not it's not a practical sort of power generation. It's more of a sort of a um, demonstrating that it that it's possible. 
Um, and the difference between this and sort of other devices, there's there's other devices called to 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 Tokamaks, which were a different design. Um, <laughs> and the difference between this and, tho and those ones is that this um, can keep the reaction going for longer. Um, so basically, what they're trying to do is um, run it at a sort of a steady state for, I think it's 30 minutes they're going to run it for. Um, whereas the Tom Tokamax can only do it in sort of short bursts of like sort of five or six minutes. Um, but they're, they're, they're hopefully going to be turning this on. I think actually, yeah, in terms of the record, I think the French one, six minutes and 30 seconds of reaction uh, of the sort of plasma that they generate. So with this one, they're hoping on getting it for, for 30, 30 minutes and generating, um, what was it going to generate? Eight, eight megawatts or something for 30 minutes. I think so, that was the plan. So, the, I mean, so just to remind everybody and myself as well, um, fission is, uh, like we've already, I've just already said what fission and fusion are, but fission is what current, um, current nuclear power stations yeah. Oh, and fusion is what we're trying to get to. Yeah, so fission is the one that basically you have to control it. So you have the, the control rods, the graphite rods that, that get pulled out, and then that allows all of the, the beams of particles to start interacting. Um, and if to, to shut them down, you have to put the rods back in again, and then they, that absorbs all of the, the sort of nuclear reaction. Um, and all the rods are under uh, water. Yeah. Um, so basically, with, with, with fission, you can get a runaway reaction, um, whereas with fusion, you can just turn off the power and it just stops. Um, you're, actually, you're actually trying to fuse together, and that, if there's no power to fuse, the water. Yeah. yeah, so there's, there's, there's sort of no danger of a runaway reaction. So it's, um, it's better for that reason, safety-wise, and it's also, but it, it has a plus plus point which is it gives off more like four times greater amount of energy isn't it? well if they, if, if they can if they can crack it so they can get it efficient and um, sustainable you'll get a lot more energy energy and you won't get sort of the the nuclear waste that you get from fission reactors um, so it's almost it's, like the perfect yeah it's 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 the ideal source of power basically um, so that's like I said that, that this is just another <clears throat> like proof of concept, effectively, yeah, so just to another, to another step forward on the testing. Yeah, yeah. To get it into this this perfect state where we yeah. can reproduce it and, and actually put it in uh, commercial reactors. Yeah, um, and I think the at the moment I think they still effectively consume more power than they create. Yes, that's, um, that's a bit of a flaw. Well, it's it, it's a it's a it's a problem if you want to. Uh, have a have a practical solution, but I think it's more the fact that while they're doing these sort of experimental phases, they're 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 they're, they're not designed to be Mega a refusion. final product. Yeah. Um, but so it's, it's not the it's a, you know I mean, the, the, it's not the fact that we can't do fusion. We've proved that we can do fusion. It's just how can we how can we make it competitive how can we make it yeah. how can we make it like a commodity in, that we can put in to yeah. many many uh, you know power stations yeah yeah and this is all this is all part of the process yep yeah, another step towards it but uh hopefully they'll they'll get there soon it's a costly process by all accounts so that, do we know if there's any other uh, projects around the world other than this german um, well i mean like i say there's 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 quite a lot of the the other design um, I think there's a, a couple of hundred, hundred sort of examples have been done in various places, um, but of this design, I'm not sure. Um, it's the largest of its kind, so I assume there's more. Okay. Yeah. So the German public, because they're the German public are down on on old style nuclear reactors, aren't they? So is this is this as well partly political that? That they they'll need a power alternative, won't they? Going forward for such a such an industrial powerhouse, they need something to take them to the next generation of power generation, don't they? Yeah, I mean, it, it, Germany's did Germany turn off all their nuclear power stations? It shows that they did, yeah. I think they did, didn't they? Um, so they, they don't have they any. Going to, after the Japanese um, issues uh, that they had with the uh, 
they they said they weren't going to build any more. Yeah. Uh, but this is like you say, this is different. Uh, and, I mean, it, it's very it's it's hard to um, explain this to the public that there is a difference. They'll just hear nuclear. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, there is a distinct difference, and uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what, I guess that's what you have to get across to everybody. But then, you see, this is interesting. This is this comes in the week where um, we hit. Uh, we've got. I think the the British power generation grid has has three um, f sort of like uh, emergency levels after um, normal, and we hit the first of those three levels this week where there wasn't enough uh, potential, like between um, sort of like five and seven or something on one night this week there wasn't enough energy in the grid so it's a demand outstripped supply because it was um for this time of the year uh obviously the plan maintenance for all of the for power stations and stuff and some of them are off offline now they were expecting this time of year there's normally a bit of wind around but for one mm -hmm. for one particular day in this week there was absolutely no wind generation yeah so they had to bring in uh Bring up back online a, um, a gas power, sta power station, and then they had to s s bring some across from Ireland, right, to meet the demand. Is but there, there is there is like three stages, and we only hit the first one. Yeah, um, but it's, it's well, I mean, it was it wasn't that long ago that they were talking about um, Hinkley, Hinkley power Hinkley, station, yeah. yeah, which is the new nuclear power station in the UK, um, which I don't know when. When was that planned to actually be online? Because what was the the announcement just recently was about the fact that it was it was going to be funded by the Chinese, um, and and it's a French project or something. So people were wondering whether that was a good idea or not. Um, but I don't know when it was actually planned to come online. Uh, so Hinkley C, I think. So Hinkley A and B. Um, have, oh, yeah. So this is this is not due to come online until the early twenty twenties. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's been granted, but uh, 2020 is a long way away. But they have started construction of it, haven't they? No, I don't think so. No. No. Mm. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, again, that's just a, a traditional nuclear power station. Um, but fusion, I think, is still definitely the one they want to crack. Um, and like you say, if they can. If they can get over the sort of like perception of nuclear being bad, um, it's it's the way forward, really. I mean, because in terms of the energy it'll produce, I think it's it's the it's the only way to sort of satisfy the needs of of, of you know usage, really. Hmm. Interesting. Um, right. Well, and it's um, got a great name. <laughs> yeah, it's Wendelstein. It's, it's like some Bond villain. Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's named after a mountain range. Most, no, I most, that most German die. words are like a Bond villain, though, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Well, uh, that's a, that's that's that one done and dusted. <sighs> out the way. We've sorted that one out for them. They just have to uh, to do it now. Yeah. And uh, the next topic is Richards, and Richards is uh, longevity and uh, the possibility that we might be able to live forever. Yeah. Would you few, believe uh, it? There's a few companies are now starting to take this seriously. So, um, you might have heard of Aubrey de Grey. He's been he's been on this subject for more than a decade now, to try and uh, inspire the world to um, take seriously the scientific effort of eliminating aging, um, which has been somewhat skeptically taken by the scientific community. But there's some signs now that it's being at least by venture capitalists being taken seriously. Um, but just a bit of background first, so the longest confirmed human lifespan right now is 122 years um, and life expectancy has gone up dramatically um, in developed countries from 1990 to now it's gone from 47 average to 80. Um, so is that oldest person alive now? That oldest person isn't alive now, I think there's, there's a, someone 119 or 118 or something like that alive now. But the overall record was 122. That's um, quite impressive. And of course, women women lived some somewhat longer than men. Um, but yeah, but the, the problem with um, those increases that we've had, 
they, they haven't really slowed down particularly, but it's felt that, the, that they will because it's diminishing returns because a lot of them have been um, curing childhood diseases and things like that, infant mortality. So so that's kind of low hanging fruit, if you like. Um, but I put mine into a, myself into a life expectancy calculator. So at 30 years old, non-smoker, no passive smoking, exercise several times a week, few saturated fats, five or more vegetables a day. So these are the criteria that insurance companies use. Um, You're going to have to give us the link for this calculator. Yeah, uh, married, no traumatic life events, um, good social group, parents are still alive, happy. So those are the actual criteria <laughs> that they ask you. Um, so for, on that, I get a, uh, an average uh, life expectancy of 84. So I've got 54 years left, basically. <laughs> oh, my God! <laughs> but, um, but, I mean, 80, around 80 is, is the new standard default for a male, isn't it, now? Yeah. So you're, you're slightly, probably above average. Yeah, I think it's like 81 or something like that. So, yeah. But, I mean, the younger you are, the higher your life expectancy um, so that's kind of the point because it's still progressing at a, at a rapid rate. Um, so if, you, if you're 25, the probability of you dying before your 26th birthday is 0.1%. So the idea is if you could keep that risk of, of dying constant throughout life um, from all age-related disease, the average person would live over a 1,000 years. So obviously after you get to... 50 and 60 and 70, that it comes down very, very rapidly due to age-related disease. So if you can do something about age-related diseases, which theoretically you could, um, you could take that that risk from 25 to 26, apply it over your whole lifespan, and you should then live until you're a thousand. Um, I'm trying. So to, I'm trying to do it now. Actually, I've got I found one. To, Let me see if I can get the results out um, before the end of this. <laughs> Um, God, they're all American. Yeah, there's, a, there's a longevity prize in the Palo Alto Longevity Prize, and there's, there's 15 scientific teams have entered this so far. Um, and it, the, the criteria is um, restoring vitality and extending lifespan in mice by 50%. So that's what they're working on. Um, Google, in who've got their, their fingers in every pie, um, they announced in September 2013 the creation of a company called Calico. Um, the California Life Company, and that has the goal of combating aging and associated diseases. So they're looking at they're looking at this as well, um, and they've they've licensed an experimental drug compound P seven C three, and that's been shown in a number of publications now to be um, beneficial in animal models for age related neuro neurodegeneration. Um, there's, well, there's, there's a few companies looking at it. I've, I've, I've come to the first life expectancy calculator. The A was in the UK based, and that's one that's on Aviva's website. Yeah. But it <laughs> it's not that scientific, I have to say. Um, basically, it, it you put in three variables. All right. And it tells you you'll live till 89. All right. Very good. <laughs> and one of those is a date of birth, one of those is gender, and when do you plan to retire? <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's probably not the best one to use. But <laughs> the other ones are in America or Americans, and I don't, um, uh, I don't know some of the um, the American um, imperial weights and measures and stuff. I don't know how much my weight is in pounds, quite frankly. So is 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 there not like some people who are talking about this and thinking is it, would it be a good idea if we all lived till. 200 or 300. Well, that would, that would be a secondary issue, but I, I guess in some sense we're already facing that because we've, because we've already gone from um, from the average age being uh, 46 in 1900 to, to what did I say? Um, Eight, 47 to uh, 80 today, then we've, we've already massively um, we've already massively stepped that up, and in fact um, they sell more nappies for adults in Japan than they do uh, nappies for children now. So it's not just a fetish thing. <laughs> but yeah, but countries are countries are now having that problem where more people are retired than, than working potentially. Um so yeah, definitely you would need to look at that. But at the same time people want to live for longer, don't they? You you know, that's part of the 
part of the goal is for you, you personally want to live longer. <laughs> yeah, but there's, there's a few others. There's a few other companies. Um, Peter Walter and his lab at uh, UCFF are developing um, a technology which modulates the integrated stress response, which is a set of pathways that are activated in response to stress, and they're looking at that to tackle age-related cognitive decline. Um, there's just a diff different ways of, of approaching it. There's a database as well, which has now got, um, or it's working towards, uh, a million human genome sequences, and they're going to get all of the super centurions into that. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is there that that data will will shed light on what, what makes for a longer but healthier life, basically. Um, but they're expecting people working on life extensions to be very interested in that data. Mm -hmm. We'll be uploading our brains in the computers in the next 50 years or so anyway, so it'll be fine. Uh, yeah. Uh, might not yeah, have I mean, been left it, after that long. This whole endeavor has been met with a lot of skepticism until now, but you, you can tell you know Google are taking an interest and um, quite a few labs are funding it. Uh, venture capitalists um, are putting their money into it. So, um, so sort of degrees thinking is now is now becoming a bit more mainstream. His basically his message is that um, he believes that the person who's going to live to a thousand years old is already alive today, yeah. um, because he says that we're, we're progressing at such a rate that the, the technology predictions, according to him, are that you know you can just keep making those gains and somebody alive today will live to a thousand. I think what worries me, yeah, I think what worries me specifically is. Um, really what the quality of life is going to be when I'm a thousand. I mean, I might be actually alive, but if my friends aren't alive, um, you know, my family will be, you know, long gone. Really? What's the point? Well, then you wouldn't take these, you wouldn't, you wouldn't take these courses of, of medicine and treatment, would you? No, I mean, it, it's not being, it's not be, being proposed to be thrust on anyone. No, I, I just, I just find it, uh, Basically, you're, and, and, and you know, when you get older, uh, and when your parents get older, um, I think you do think about mortality a lot more. Um, and ultimately, what you want is, you know, you're not going to live forever, but you just you want to be as healthy as possible while you're here. <laughs> yeah. um, and and I think that's that's the only aim I'm I'm going for that I don't. Well, pre have. presumably that would be part and parcel of it. I mean, clearly, if if most people are getting getting Alzheimer's by the time they're seventy, you, you clearly can't have that. You clearly can't have that. Or di dementia, sorry. Um, you clearly can't have that happening. If you if you if you're trying to go for a thousand, you're going to have to fix those problems, aren't you? Because because those conditions are fatal. So you're never going to get to a thousand unless you eliminate all of that. Mm. So, so presumably, as well, if if this is a society wide thing, also your friends and family are going to be. It's not going to be just. Just you, John, <laughs> living to a thousand, um, like that Goldie Horn film. Um, presumably, if your friend, what Goldie Horn film? Um, there's a Goldie Horn film where where they're, they're drinking elixir and they can live for they live forever. I can't think what it's called. Oh, the uh, one with Bruce Willis in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's oh, cool. it's the, the two. It's two of the, yes, God, I've actually seen it. <gasps> I've seen a film. film. I've seen. Blimey. Yeah, I remember. There's two two women, isn't there? And they keep going, and bits of the skin start falling off, and I have to keep patching them up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, mm -hmm. I remember that. I don't know what it's called. But but basically, Degree kind of uses that analogy. He says it's like a vintage car. If you if you properly maintain a vintage car, um, and you replace the parts and it's well maintained, there's no expiry date to a vintage car. A vintage car can keep going and going. So, his sort of metaphor is that that we are biological machines. So as long as you find out what's making each part deteriorate and fix it before it's fatal to you, there's no reason in principle that you can't just keep extending it in that fashion. You also think you get hit by a bus and killed outright, but 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 in terms of degenerative diseases, which is the main thing that people die of. Um, yeah. In terms of sort of like the aging process, you know, there's that whole thing of like you know the the, the amount of time that it takes for all the cells in your body to regenerate or something, and it's like. Yeah. It's a matter of years or something like that. I can't, I can't remember what it is. Yeah. Why do you age if that's the case? If the cells are being regenerated? Well, the, the rate at which they can repair and regenerate is declining with age, doesn't it? So I did that topic about injecting the, the blood, whether we're injecting 
young mice blood and older mice and that showed improvements in the, the, the in cells ability to repair and yeah. so it's it's, it's, it's it, it is funny it's it is funny um i don't know whether whenever i go and give blood um obviously it when they take blood out of the system obviously you have to generate new blood cells and uh, I do always feel better. I don't know whether it's just psychological because I've actually given some blood and helped somebody, but I always feel better after I've... Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's psychological, not because you should probably feel slightly worse because your iron stores and stuff will be depleted, won't they? But you have a cup of tea and then you feel fine. And a, and a, a little custard cream. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's that's great. I'm really happy. But the problem is, of course, when if you if you're going to live to a thousand, your you, your pension won't last. <laughs> so you'll be a pauper. Well, so, I mean, do you not think? Do you not think that really, like, to me, when people say, "Oh, well, um, why would you want to live to a thousand? Isn't that just a bit of a lack of imagination? Because it's kind of like an argument from natural in the sense that, like, well, we'll have we we'll like the lifespan that we have. Yeah. If 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 you can imagine a society where everyone lives to six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred, and that was the norm, yeah. Um, and then your life is planned, and like you say, you'd you'd have to get all that right. There'd have to be enough money for everyone. You know, you wouldn't want that to be at the cost of the youth, and you wouldn't want that problem being tenfold worse than it is now. You'd have to you'd have to fix all of that at the same time. But if you can do that, and in countries where I don't know Switzerland and Sweden and stuff like that, where the the fertility rate is now um, in the negative, so people are having less. Ch people are dying without having as many children. Well, you know, so I'm, I'm not going to have down. children. But in that situation, it would be possibly beneficial for the, those people to be able to carry on working longer if they wanted to do so and live longer. Mm. Um, you know, it might it might fix some some problems because first first world developed countries, even though we've got a population problem on a planetary scale. In a lot of first world developed countries now, they're having a, a problem where there's not enough people of working age, so maybe it's a solution to that. Mm -hmm. And like you say, I mean, the, the, the sort of 80 years is sort of, it's just arbitrary really, it just happens to be how long we're living. If, if it was that everyone lived till 300, it would, it would be, you know, you wouldn't think that was unnatural. Yeah. So anyone saying, oh, why would, you know, why would you want to live longer than 100? Well, I'd say, well, yeah, why wouldn't you, sort of thing. Uh, there's two two drugs that I just want to quickly mention as well. Um, one's already in in clinical trials. It's called um, I'm not going to get this right. Rapamycin. Uh, it's R A P A M Y C I N. Um, this is a, a drug that's already used to aid um, organ transplants and rare cancers. And they've been trialing this on mice and found that it's extended. It's just a trial at the moment, but they've, they've found that it's extended the life of the mice by, by 25% in healthy mice. Um, so they believe that this may protect against diseases um, and, and cancers and neuro, neuro degeneration. So can you imagine that if it's scaled to humans, which it probably won't, but if it, if it were to, 25% extension on that one drug alone is amazing. Um, and there's another called... Um, Nova Vartis, which has been used in um, healthy elderly volunteers in Australia and New Zealand, um, and a variant of this drug has um, enhanced their response to flu vaccine by 20%. So you give them it prior to getting the flu vaccine, and it, it makes the flu vaccine 20% more efficient. Now, the interesting part about that is that uh, immunity to flu goes down with old age, so maybe that tells us something. It's great that it's going to help that boost 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 flu immunity, but it also might tell you something about, you know what you were saying before about things get worse at, as you get older, um, if that drug can reverse that and can help your immunity response, that's going to help you with a whole host of diseases because your body, your sort of, your first responders in your body are going to be better at heading things off before they get really bad. Mm -hmm. um, so another intriguing one, but it, it, this has all happened in the last five years, ten years, so a lot of it's now happening. We haven't seen any of these technologies for life extension um, that are that are being designed for that purpose come to the market yet. And I was going to say, is, is that just because it's a recent area of of actual investment and study? I think this, the community hasn't taken it seriously until now oh, yet. Yeah. So so it's now it's now being taken seriously. So it'll be interesting to see how you know see if it's got any legs now that now that more people are on board, not just that one guy with a big long beard. Yeah, well, is, it will be. <laughs> it will be taken up by the the powerful and rich first. 
I reckon. So this is, is, that, is that necessarily a good thing? Well, isn't that true of everything though? But I mean, yeah, that argument does get made, but then you can say that about, you know, we've got, we as people living in the developed world have got access to drugs for everything and the third world doesn't yet. Mm. So income inequality is going to be the case. Well, it's going to, it's going to fall foul of the same thing, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you, you could just you could just let the powerful and rich be our little um, lab test. Test tested on Bill Gates. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, I guess I guess people are genuinely concerned about that because it's it's another it's another level up, isn't it? On you know saving someone's life and extending someone's life, it has more serious ramifications, I suppose. Yeah. But then you could argue a mosquito net is a life extension technology that the third world doesn't have access to, and we do. So I suppose in, in one sense it's, it's not too much different. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, there you go. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm for it, providing that uh, I'm healthy enough uh, and, you know, and, and, and I have enough cash to survive and, and I've got some people to talk to, <laughs> basically. <laughs> All for that. Right. Anyway, um, we're on to the last topic of this evening, and it's mine, and it's um, we're going to talk about drones. Now, drones have um, seemingly covered the world in the last couple of years. They've gone from um, a little niche thing to sort of like a com- almost a commodity object. And uh, uh, I'm hoping to get one for Christmas. I'm buying myself one as a present. And... Uh, this one, however, is a bit different. This one is pretty large, and when I say pretty large, I mean it's the b- biggest drone in the world. Um, to be fair, it's probably been marketed more as a hybrid helicopter than a drone, uh, and it's electric, uh, so it's it's also as well as the biggest drone in the world. It's probably the big the, the world's first electric helicopter. It's called a, a Volocopter, and uh, I have some footage for you, so please let me just share this out for you so you can see stuff things here. So that is uh, a big hanger. Uh, it's made, the company's called um, eVolo, and they're a German company. Are they uh, filming a drone for a drone? Uh, yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, this is the guys. This is the guys who who, who invented it uh, from Evolo. Now, um, the reason why they're in a pretty damned huge hangar is because uh, because of German um, uh, aviation laws, they can't fly it outside yet. Um, but as you can see, they've got a big battery uh, and uh, they're pushing leads in very important places. Uh, now, the so the idea is it does look for people who are listening to this on the podcast. It basically is it's a it's a, a circular structure with uh, 18 rotors on top uh, so they're assembled with indiv- in- independent um, propellers uh, with essentially a small sort of um, helicopter bolted on the bottom I was going to say, what, uh, why has it got a cockpit? Well, because you can, you can have two people in it so <laughs> you, the idea is you can either, you can either do it uh, radio control like this, this is doing now uh, in, the, in, the, in the video they're, they're operating that radio controlled um, but you can also fly it with two guys in, so it's got a joystick in there as well. So um, now, like I said, that this is all—it's all done internally, but it does actually work, as you as you can see. Um, so the the biggest um, the biggest uh, issue is um, is the battery life at the moment. <laughs> uh, it's only got thirty minutes of battery life. <laughs> So they're, they're having to work on that, but um, but it's interesting. It's certainly interesting. So here's a question for you: What what is the definition of a drone? It's a uh, uh, because because that that to all intents and purposes looked like a helicopter to me. Yeah, I think it's. So, I don't. I, well, I don't know. I have to say. I mean, it's you get, you get UAV as well. Yeah, but it's they're, they're not drones, are they? Or are they? I don't know. Is drone just un- is not just unmanned in the general. I think sense. It, ha- it, ha- it has to be remotely operated. Uh-huh. I think that's part of it. So that it can be remotely operated. So it is a drone, 
But the Reaper, the Reaper and Predator drones that the US use for the military strikes are rather large, aren't they? They're, they've got like wingspan of eighty foot or something. I don't think it's. Yeah. I don't think it's a, a small. I don't think it's a size thing. I don't think that comes into it. It's just it's a remotely operated vehicle. Yeah. No, no, I'm saying, but you're saying it's a big one. I'm saying the Reaper drones are enormous, aren't they? They're like jet sized. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, it's, but they, well, like I say, they're UAVs rather than drones. They don't really, although they do say drone strikes, don't they? Yeah. But is that just, uh, we were talking last week, uh, Richard and I, about parlance of, of media, that they'll mm. just use the word that everybody else knows to yeah. mean the same thing, even though it's yeah. not accurate. Yeah. So it might be just, that's what they call it. Yeah, them. I think UAV is the, is the correct is yeah. the correct term, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I thought, I thought I'd also talk a little bit about um, some of the other drone stuff that's going, going on uh, around the world. Um, the uh, Google are in talks with the Federal Aviation Administration, to change uh, aviation laws in America, uh, so that their their X project wing um, is is in order to, to, to the changing the air traffic control system. So they have a again a drone ATC as well as a, like a full air aircraft ATC, and uh, and also in Australia. They are um, testing delivering mail. I mean, there's a few countries doing this as well. Germany, DHL in Germany, Singapore Post, Swiss Post, they're all testing it. But they reckon that uh, the Australia Post, because of the the geographical enormity of Australia and where all the um, the people are, and there's some people in the middle of nowhere, they reckon that delivering post by, um, by drone is actually more probable and might actually be starting regular service by the end of uh, next year so which yeah. is interesting but I, it's it is interesting more that I, I still don't know how they're going to do it with battery life because um i suppose they'll oh. do it from from a nearest town to a, a you know a shack in the middle of the outback or something if it's if it's if it's small enough surely they'll be able to make it sort of solar powered yeah, I suppose so. so yeah, I you know, obviously, so. a big one like that, it, it, it's not going to get enough energy. But a small one that's not going to take much power to actually fly, that that could solve that. Especially, you know, in a country like Australia, you're going to have plenty of sunshine. Um, so that might work for that. But uh, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, the re I think that probably one of the reasons why Australia will be, apart from the geographical um, issues that they've got, where they've got people in the outback. Mm. And uh, they'll probably fly from the near. They'll put the mail in. They'll fly it from the nearest town out to the thing, out to their outback out shack, drop the mail off, and come back. So that's so. There's a geographical reason why they would want to do that, but also because they've, the Australian Civil Aviation Authority have actually um, have actually changed the rules yes. to accommodate drones already, so they can actually fly them um, without fear of um, well, look, still. They'll crash into something, I suppose. <laughs> but I, I guess if they've put rules in place, then they'll have to have you'll have to do exams as a pilot or something. I would have thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Yep, very good. So uh, what, I, I yeah. understand that you were talking about drones last night. We were. We were talking about um, because um, Joe, who we're out with, is working for a company who are. They're a company that um, are. Looking into um, what was it? It was like um, using drones for like search and rescue type thing. I think is oh, the is the idea behind that. But with infrared which, cameras and stuff. Yeah, which I think is something that's been been talked about before. Going into sort of dangerous areas um, where, like you know, it's it after earthquakes or something like that. You don't want people to go in if the buildings are unstable. But obviously, if you have a drone that can go in and search for people, it you know it, it it's quite a, a good area to look into. Quite a good um, use. For drones, um, above and beyond just taking pretty pictures and videos, um, which I guess, is I guess they're, they're, they're using they're using sort of land-based um, remote vehicles in Fukushima and stuff like that. So yeah, I guess yeah. the next step is quite easily a, a drone thing. Yeah. And if you can, and if you can, uh, and if it is solar powered, you can essentially just take it up above a scene and just let it hover. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. you'll get a camera on on the on that area, and it'll be there for you know the. You'll see, you'll get live pictures back constantly, which mm -hmm. is obviously a, going to be a benefit. You won't have yeah. to get in there and put a camera in. You can just hover it above. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. But I mean, there's lo there's loads of different uses for them, really, when you think about it. Um, but yeah, I think uh, 
in this country, they're, they're very restrictive now, aren't they, in terms of airspace. You're not allowed to fly over a certain height or close to anything vaguely dodgy. Um, you know, there's, there's, you, do, it, it, you do hear stories of them, you know, a drone buzzed a plane, and it's like, yeah, it was 500 meters away from it, but, yeah. Yeah, and also it's, it's probably the size of a, you know, that big. Yeah, and, uh, it wouldn't really bring down a plane. It's a 747. Yeah. Yeah, I know who's going to win that one. <laughs> Although you wouldn't much want it going into the turbine leg. No, that is true. No. But it's, no. it wouldn't shouldn't, wouldn't be like like bird strike. Mm. If you've got a plane, you can you can land on one engine. I yeah. mean, okay, it's it it shouldn't happen, and it's yeah. not L- less than ideal. I'm not saying get everybody get <laughs> to, get them up there and buzz the planes, but I, I guess it's it's not a it's not going to be a huge thing. No, unless unless. Well, you know, you can get rather large drones now, so I'm assuming that it's the little ones that you buy from uh, your hobby shops. Yeah. Um, I still like the footage of the, the, I can't remember who it is who does it, but there's or, the autonomous ones where you have the swarms. And they can sort oh, of. Oh, they like, talk to each other. Yeah, and they can, like, throw sticks between each other and balance them on top and, you know, fly through windows at a funny angle. It's, yeah, and it's they're, they're actually quite cheap, those, aren't they? They're quite yeah. affordable stuff for those. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. They're, 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 to have any decent maneuverability, you wouldn't actually have anyone flying it. You'd just have it flying itself. Um, well, I, I, to be honest, I've, I've um, Andy Armstrong, who we had on, uh, mm. oh god, a good few months ago now. Um, he showed me some of his drone footage, and uh, he's obviously got a very expensive drone, which is about fifteen hundred quid, uh, with uh, f- its four K um, camera, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that was pretty great but he yeah. also had another one which is maybe it's like 150 quid and uh and that was that was you know it was 1080 um hd and it was pretty damn good considering that the uh um it was all done uh stability control was all done in software right and, uh, and it operated from a, a an app on a phone uh-huh. <laughs> and uh he shows the photos of that and it's like yeah that that's pretty good footage yeah. so i think i might buy that uh, for yeah. christmas i might give myself a present Excellent. What are you going to film? Uh, well, I haven't thought about that. Everything. Really down everything. Practically. It's everything and everything, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Right. Um, any more? Any more? No, that's the yeah. end. I, 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 sense, I sense a lot of hangovers in the room. So <laughs> we'll, I think we'll probably just uh, draw a veil over episode 48 <laughs> now. And um, again, we're creeping closer and closer to episode 52, our birthday. We still haven't. I, I haven't really thought about it, but I, I'm, sh- I'm sure we should do something at least, even if it's just wear party hats. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I think I think probably what I think the only things that we're going to do is uh, a we're going to change the domain name so we so we have uh, wonderstuff.com rather than the blogspot address. I don't think there's any way of keeping both. Um, and also we're gonna. I'm just gonna stop putting the podcasts and everything on directories and. And on uh, iTunes, so you should be able to download it from iTunes. So, um, as always, um, please send us feedback in. Uh, we have, of course, our uh, our Twitter handles, which which is just me actually tonight. I think. Yeah, mine's not working. <laughs> uh, yeah, Google, sort yourself out again, please. Um, uh, so yeah, it's Twitter handles, and then we've got email address of wondrousstuff at gmail dot com. We all have access to that mailbox. And the URL currently is wonderstuff.blogspot.com. Please um, tell your friends, get them signed up, uh, massage, get them to massage their brains on a Sunday evening or any time really. And uh, and you know, we, if we are talking rubbish, please correct us. If you like what we're talking, please tell us. Uh, so anyway, I think what we'll do now is uh, say goodbye for this episode. And uh, see you again this time next week for episode 49. Until then, au revoir, everybody, au revoir. Bye. Bye.